Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been the penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Tuesday edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. Spencer Israel here with Joel Conan and Dennis Dick. I guess the theme of the day is whether or not yesterday's relief rally will continue. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about uh, analyst changes to Roku uh, and Red Hat. uh, Red Hat. We've got a secondary offering from Overstock, and we'll take your questions, as always, uh, from our chats. uh, If we have time throughout the show, and more specifically from 9 to 9.15, uh, in that window there. Our guest today, Nick Shaheen, author of Create Income with Option Spreads, our go-to option expert. Joel, what's what's happening this morning in the S&Ps? Uh, continuation rally here, up 13 handles at 26.72.50. Your pre-market high, 79.75. Folks, I don't have much resistance in here at all, but uh, keep an eye on that as a target. You have crude. Uh, that's trading in the green here by 33 cents at uh, 65 88. Let's take a look at the daily chart. Get some resistance here. Eyeballing it. <clears throat> 68 6 seems to be the level here. A couple pops above it. Uh, let's get a couple closes above it for a continued rally. Gold is in the red by $3.70. That gold is trying to clear $13.50 for good and make a shot of $1,400. Silver in the red by a nickel at $16.63. And Dennis's favorite thing to trade, Bitcoin, is uh, down 3%, under $8,000 at $7,990.46. Dennis, boy, you did a lot of buying yesterday around noon. What what did you do? Did you go to like uh, 150% mm-hmm. uh, <clears throat> stocks in your portfolio to cause that rally? I wish I would have. Wow. So we talked about this yesterday on the show, and I thought that, you know, we could get some of this back. I was fading the rally. Fade worked, and I actually sold some stuff. It did work for a bit. Um, Because if you look, right off the opening, we opened around 263 on the SPY. And then the Facebook news hit, and we started leaking. Went down to 262, down to 261, down to 260. We almost went red. And then they turned around and just started buying, and they did not stop for the rest of the day. After being under $260, SPY goes up and goes above $265. Incredible day. It was on a points basis on the Dow, something like the second or third biggest day ever, and the biggest day since the financial crisis for a rally. What do we end up on the Dow? Up like 700 or something? Uh, yeah, we uh, <laughs> none at, of us follow the Dow here, so yeah. it's just a matter what, what of what we heard Dow? from the media. Uh, but well, here's the interesting thing uh, we closed on Thursday 24,168, and actually, Wednesday's close was right there as well. Um, or, um what am I looking at? I'm looking at the uh, 15 minute, I need to be looking at the daily, so let me switch to my daily chart. Uh, Thursday's close was at 20, roughly 24,000. We lost 500 on Friday to 23,500. And now we're back above Thursday's close. We're at 24,2. That was yesterday's close and probably tacking on another couple hundred, 150 off the open. Uh, I just think longer term here. And I was looking, examining this chart last night, look at the S and P's. How long are we going to have this trading range? You know, maybe we're not going to take out the lows and the moves and maybe we're not going to make an all time high, but maybe we're going to, you know, come and find a, you know, a range here, a big range at that between 2600 and 2800. And that's uh, that's what I'm looking for. Let's jump over to some individual stock news. Uh, we had one earning stock of note. We're going to get a few big ones tonight, Lululemon. We're going to get our H. But let's go to the stock from last night that did report that is getting a nice pop. It's Red Hat, our HT. This stock here kicking up and making new all-time highs. Another tech stock leading the way. New all-time highs for Red Hat. They report on the right day. It's all about timing. And when you're out, you got a day that the markets went up 700 points on the Dow and you're reporting earnings, you're probably, if you're doing something pretty good, you're probably going to go up because everybody's hungry for stocks. And they were hungry yesterday for stocks. So Spencer, 
Give us the details as Red Hat's timing was perfect. 91 cents on the Q4 EPS versus an 81 cent estimate sales of 772 versus 761 million dollars. So beats on the Q4 numbers. <coughs> Q1 guidance coming in. Uh, the EPS guidance was a little, a little bit light. 68 cents versus 72 cents. Uh, sales guidance was higher by about $10 million. And the fiscal year guidance came in uh, higher. So fiscal uh, slightly higher, but this isn't a blowout report. And you'd say, you know, we follow our theory. If you've been run up in the report, you got to blow it away. You got to report on the right day. Re- reporting on the right day is more is more important than anything, Joel. If they would have reported this like last Thursday or last Friday, they would have it would have been down ten bucks. But because they're so hungry for stocks, they're like it, it's all about you know you look at you can find good things in a report if you look at it always. You can usually find bad things in a report if you look at it just the right way. And here we are, it's up ten bucks because they report on the right day. That's why it's up ten bucks. Uh, blowing away the uh, the former <laughs> old time high. The old time high uh, was made this month at one fifty seven twenty two. Uh, still more work to do on the upside here as we speak. We just printed 163.50, and that is the high of the session. So let this baby breathe, 163.88. Dennis, you could probably get lifted at 164 if you felt like it right now. So uh, keep your high, you know, whatever, 929 and 29 seconds. Uh, that will be uh, some potential resistance. Uh, Dennis, um, Soho196 uh, wants to thank you. He said you saved uh, him some loot on Boeing. And uh, what he did is he said, uh, when you said you were going to short it, he did the right thing. He went out and bought it lower. And then he I don't know if I said I was going to short it. I said I would be, you know, I was looking at the 332 level as a possible resistance point. But anyways, if you interpret that as a short, that was the high yesterday. So the call worked out. Um, I didn't short it, though. Okay, well, he bought it into it and used that area as resistance. So that's good. You're using a level um, like we give these resistance levels. They're not you know, necessarily mean as short, but use them as targets on the long side, right? And that's what uh, Soho 196. That was the did. high of the day. Yeah. yeah. So if you were selling it and it sold off hard in the morning with everything else, it didn't come all the way back like everything else did, though. So you are still in that range here. We yeah. are trading at the top of the range here again, but it's a pesky range for Boeing. We talked that the high and the low. We're basically matching from Friday and from Monday, or actually from Thursday and Friday. And then yesterday's candle doesn't get out of there either. So you get about 332, you start to think about 340. I know we're trading it in the pre market here right now, but you know, this market's still chopping around. We don't know where Boeing's going to open up. Obviously, I'm talking your intraday charting, so we don't have any intraday candles here yet because it's still in the pre market. Get about 332, start going 333, 334, then you start thinking about 340. But if you can't get about 332, that's still your resistance. And resistance is resistance until it is broken. All right. Uh, so we had the earnings report from uh, Red Hat. Were they the only big ones scheduled? At the- yeah, there was really nothing else. Um, you had McKesson this morning. or No, sorry. Um, McCormick this morning, MKC. They are trading up three bucks. Quickly, we'll give 10 seconds of love to McKesson. What are their numbers, Spencer? Uh, uh, McCormick. I don't know why I said McKesson. Yeah, it yeah, really messed McCormick. me up. M- MC- McCormick. MKC, the uh, spice company, right? Right, right. Uh, yeah, a dollar EPS uh, versus ninety-one cent estimate uh, sales in line, one point two four billion dollars. Uh, raised their fiscal year uh, EPS guidance by five cents. It's right up at the old time high here, or actually, is that an all time high? No. Yeah, maybe it is. Wow, there's a lot of stocks still trading near their all time highs. Anyways, one eleven twenty nine. That was the high. Actually, one eleven forty six. That was the high. Just back at the middle of the March, March 12th. So you kissed up a 111. That's the resistance level there. Keep an eye on that level. Starts taking that out. It gets more interesting. But this one usually isn't that volatile. I, I, my thoughts exactly here. That 111 print, that's just ahead of the all-time highs. Uh, all-time closing high uh, was made in that same time period at uh, 110.74. But uh, on the dailies, you have three highs between 111.29 and that all-time high at 111.46. So uh, there's your your resistance. If we go into reverse and you're looking for a gap fill, you got a long way to go. Uh, yesterday's high in the stock, way down at 107.26. Let's jump over here to 
um, merger land. And actually, there's a couple to talk about this morning, but um, this one's interesting. It's smaller companies We're talking mall REITs here. GGP is going to be acquired. It looks like by BPY. Spencer, give us the details here. And I just want to talk about, you know, devils in the details there. So you're going to have some questions after this. Go ahead, though, with the details. All right. GGP shareholders will be entitled uh, to elect to receive either 2350 a share in cash uh, or one BPY uh, uh, of one BPY unit or uh, it's confusing. So there's a 2350 price and there's also, yeah, there's also uh, or they can get that or they can get one share of the new U.S. REIT security. Uh, but there's a there's another ratio involved. The exchange ratio is like nine, six point nine, six, five, six to one. It, 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 it's confusing. OK, so first of all, I don't want any BPY unit because that's at 1948. So if I'm a GGP shareholder and if you're, you're saying, oh, you can buy one BPY unit while well, BPY itself is trading in 1948. So I don't want that. Um, do I want the new REIT? Maybe BPY US REIT, you know, they're going to form a company together and you could get one share of that. So that's a possibility. What I really want if I'm a GGP shareholder is that 2350 in cash. So you can look at this and say, well, I'm taking the cash because the thing's at 2150. So I'm going to buy it after or buy it pre-market here at 2150. This is hypothetical situation. And, you know, elect the cash and get 2350 and make two bucks. What's up? Why wouldn't you do that? Well, the reason is there isn't enough cash for everybody to get it. So that's your devil in the details. So you could try to get the 2350 in cash, but there might not be enough cash to go around. So you might end up getting the BPY share, or you might end up getting you know, the shares of the new company here. Probably you, you can like to get the shares of the new company. So that's why it's trading at 21 and a half because the 23 and a half, there's not enough. If everybody chose cash, there's not enough cash to go out. So that's why it's trading down here at 2150 because I think a lot of people are just going to get shares of this new REIT that they're going to form between the two companies. Devil in the details. If you just said 2350 cash and that was all that was there, this thing would be up at 2340 right now. Yeah. That's why it's a 21 and a half. Yeah, they did get a spike uh, to over 20, 23 bucks. And then someone like read the devil in the details there. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, hey, it, there's not enough cash to go around. Here, for here's my question. Cash. If, there, if there's not enough cash, if they're do, trying to do a cash deal and there's not enough cash to go around, should they really be doing the deal? I mean, that's well, it's a cash or stock deal. Yeah. So it's not I... a pure cash deal. That's why they put that in there or stock. Yeah. So you get shares of the new company or cash. You can try to get, you can apply, you know, and then they're going to do it on whatever, you know, ratio or pro rate or rata, you know, so way that they do it. I didn't read that much into the detail. I just, as soon as I said, you know, as soon as I said, there might not be a cat, enough cash for everybody to take the 2350. I'm like, well, this ain't worth 2350 right now. And that's why we're at 21 and a half. Strange so if you're deal. scratching your head, why a 2350 takeout is trading at 2150. That is why. And not even that big of a premium either. So I don't know how this is going to affect. Let's just take a look at um, some of our other reads here. I mean, uh, GG. I don't think it affects any of them yeah. at all, but give us one. Topman. TCO, that stock is, uh, boy, that's been in the doghouse and trying to recover. Uh, Duke Realty, I don't know. These things, none of these charts. They're all in the doghouse. Yeah. I, I mean, it's I, not, it right. hasn't been a good time to be REITs, rising interest rate environments. And then you talk about, you know, mall REITs. We've been talking about the death of the mall. I mean, I, you know, is go to your local mall and you can see, you know, they're not as busy as they used to be. Plus, you know, there's some of these mall zero are starting to turn to ghost towns. So I'm not a fan of buying any mall REITs. You've been bearish, Tom, and forever. And that's a completely different story, but pure play on mall REITs. I mean, or, or on mall stocks, I guess that's not a REIT. I don't know if it's set up as a REIT. Anyways, uh, you know, got killed in October, came back with everything, but I don't know, long-term malls just aren't as hot as they used to be. People live in cyberspace more than they used to. They don't live in the malls as much. Spencer, do you go to malls still? No, no, not That's really. That's thing a news desk. Those boys, they're all no, fairly no, young. Really. They're going to malls. Brentster, are you going to malls? I, no, no one here really. No, Brentster's not in yet. Luke, you go to malls? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got Luke's his, still a mauler. Yeah, he's still he got that new wardrobe there. Uh, <laughs> Larry, Larry Glickman. Luke's special though. <laughs> Larry Glickman in the chat making uh, an observation here. Uh, Today, IPO holders can sell in Roku. Now, remember when Twitter had that? There was big anticipation. I don't know. Are they going to want to sell it uh, 33 bucks, 34 bucks when the stock was over 55? Or 
think they're going to wait. You can never tell, you know, on these yeah, days. I, I, I don't know if I'd be short and ahead of uh, the being able to sell here, especially the way it came down. Dennis, any thoughts on We uh, made this argument last week when we knew Roku was, I think it was on Roku, and we were just arguing that when stocks are trading near their highs, this is more influential when they're you know then in stock that's you know given back 20 points from the highs because people don't you know even though you know they, they couldn't sell up there they still look at it and say well it was 50 dollars before i'm not selling at 33 so you'll have less people electing to sell today that being said stock is still trading in the red so maybe there's gonna be a few people to sell today roku did catch an upgrade i believe today too did it not wasn't roku upgraded Upgraded at Citigroup uh, to neutral, and the price target. Yeah. they raised the price target a whopping three dollars. So that's interesting in itself because here's the stock it's upgraded, still trading down. So obviously having a little bit of influence here, but I still think there's a lot of people that aren't going to sell because the stock is not at the highs anymore, and not even close to the highs. Good level on the downside. Your two-day low, Friday's low, thirty-two eighty-five. That's a buck away. If you're looking to rather buy this thing. On strength, you've got three highs right at 35 and a half. So that's your super extra major resistance. That 32.85, that was a low from Friday. Uh, that was just a, a couple bucks above the 30.50 low. The only thing about, you know, if it takes out this 32.85, you got these two candles to uh, contend with here and the big gap up after earnings. So, uh, kind of thin after that. And uh, we'll see what kind of volume, let's see what happens. Uh, in Roku, R-O-K-U, Dennis, have you purchased yet or put it on your television? You put it on your TV, right? You download it? Is that what no, it is? No, it's, it's a, um, a it's box. Built into the TV, it, it, it? It's, it's either a box or it's built into the TV. So I don't mind, you know, just looking at it. Let's see what it does today. This is a big day for it. 3180 is low. It's got a hold. That's the low from Friday. That's the low that needs to hold. So if you're saying, you know, you think the bottom is in, this is the time to buy Roku. That is the one thing is this is a market that I don't want to buy any really high multiple high yep. beta stocks because the um, you know they were obviously killed before yesterday. I'm still a little skeptical of yesterday's rally. And Reuters reporter called me, and that's what my quote was: is that yes, it's a great day for the markets, but how much of that was just you know I, I don't know like how it was all politically driven by that China headline that we're talking again. And if all of a sudden you know well talks are breaking down. They can give it all back. So there's a still political uncertainty here. There's still, you know, yes, if, you know, we can come up and, you know, there's not going to be a trade war, we get better relations with China. That's good for the market. So the headline was good over the weekend, but I still think there's, you know, political uncertainty and some risk out there. And there's headline risk here. So that's why I don't think we're out of the woods yet on this market whatsoever. And that's why I was not buying from my investment portfolio there yesterday. Even though, you know, some people will argue we tested, you know, we did test the lows from February there, you know, on Friday, didn't quite get there. It was a nice rebound, beautiful candle yesterday. It's nice to see some follow through strength here today, but you know, we don't know where the Facebook thing is going yet. And we don't know, you know, where it's happening with China. There's still a lot of unknowns. If you're long, long term, you're probably okay. Short term, I'm not sure here. And if you're trying to buy now, you know, you're 770 handles from the low. So you're chasing it a little bit now. Uh, let's see here. Ed Parker in the chat, long some Amazon. He wants to know if it's heading back to sixteen hundred. Well, I can't. Oh, I can't tell. Amazon you. is just the stock. Okay. <laughs> How uh, do you stop this thing? I mean, it could be sixteen hundred bucks today. It's already up fourteen more. Uh, I was, I was sold. I don't think it would get to sixteen hundred. I mean it. No, nah, I'm joking. From a valuation perspective, it's always been scary, but we know Amazon doesn't make as much money as they could. So, you know, the sales numbers are always incredible. What is it, like 9 or 10% of all retail sales now or something through Amazon? It's incredible. Anyways, um, incredible company. I, I'm not fighting Amazon, but I'm also not paying, you know, up here for it either. So, but I've been off the Amazon train for a while. Not that, you know, I've never had it. I've not been invested in it because it's not a value stock. And we know me, I like my value stocks. So. And, and people ask you, why are you why do you like value stocks so much? You want to know why? You know why, Joel. Why why am I a value guy? Uh, because they're they're actually making money. And uh, you because know Because I went through the tech bubble <laughs> first. I went through the financial crisis and I saw what happened to stocks that had huge multiples. And if they all of a sudden, you know, aren't producing the kind of profits that everybody anticipated, they get slaughtered eventually. 
So that's why, you know, in the long run, I've always been a value investor buying companies. So I'm not going to get these, you know, and I'm never going to have these years where I'm up 30, 40% of my best portfolio, but I'll never have those years that I'm down 30 or 40% nope. either nope. because my portfolio is so conservative. I have like, you know, I've got, and like I've said before, I've got a lot of dividend stuff, very focused on dividends, a lot of preferred stocks. I, you know, my, my portfolio's goal is to grow seven to 10% a year. And that's what the market gives overall, you know, it's in, in the long, long term. So if I grow, you know, so last year and I didn't look at my portfolio performance, I probably should watch it closer. But, you know, I'm probably in that ballpark. I was probably up a little bit more because I did have some growth stocks in there. I own Google, I own Apple, and those had big years. But overall, my portfolio underperforms in a bull market, but it also outperforms in a bear market. And just because we're in a seven-year bull run doesn't mean there's bear, not bear markets going to happen again in the future. I sleep better at night knowing that if the you know markets fall 30% in the next few weeks or month, that my portfolio is not going to lose 30%. And, you know, maybe it's not because I'm, you know, I'm not 20 years old anymore. I'm 41. I'm still, you know, fairly young. But at the same time, I just think if I can get 7 to 10% on a lower beta portfolio and the market's going to chop around, you know, over 30 years and in the long run, just give me 7 to 10% anyways, I feel like I'm doing it in a safer way. Well, so that's why I'm a value guy, I play safer stocks. Uh Amazon, I uh, hit that all-time high at uh, what was the all-time? Did it ever get over sixteen hundred? It did. It got to sixteen oh five. So, Ed, you know what I'm going to do here? I'm going to look at that uh, the fifty percent retracement, sixteen oh five down to fourteen ninety five. That takes you right to the fifteen uh, fifty level. We are trading above that. Uh, a couple targets on the upside. If you don't want to hold out for uh, sixteen hundred fifteen seventy three eighty five, uh, that was your three day high. And then if it really keeps going ahead of sixteen hundred, you have a double top at fifteen eighty seven and fifteen ninety. So uh, those are uh, uh, just ahead of that all time high. Okay. Um, Spinner, keep me honest here. And I think it's an interesting conversation. I mean, you know, the market's just sitting here anyways. Let's go look at my portfolio here. I'll give you, a, a, you know, a bunch of the stocks that I you own. Like know why you bought, uh, I don't know if you want me to list off 100 stocks. AMD. But I can tell you. He's saying Spinner just said AMD is not a value stock. Completely agree with you. Um, you know, I, I do have some stocks in there that are not value stocks. So I'm not 100% value stocks, but if you looked at my portfolio overall, you would say this is, you know, definitely more of a Warren Buffett approach as opposed to, you know, this huge growth portfolio. But AMD right now, I'm just trying to bring out my portfolio. I'm not sure why it's not showing my holdings. There it is. Okay, so I'm going to my holdings. Da, da, da. AMD right now of my portfolio, it's a small position. It's 0.35%. So it's very small. My bigger positions, so if you just want to look at the bigger ones, Avvi is a pretty big one. Like I said, I have 100 stocks. So, you know, That's when it's crazy, 2%, man. it's a bigger I don't know portion. How you do that. ABBV is a bigger one. It's 1.94%. Abbott Labs also 1.24%. I'm just, there's some big, bigger ones though. Harris Corp, this is the one that I bought back during the financial crisis, HRS. This one's 3.3% on my portfolio. It's a big chunk because it's grown so much. Get, I out. This. Get out of this yeah. one. Move some money around. I bought that stock at $28 in the financial crisis, 162 now. So, you know, that's, you know, I bought it because it was a value stock at one time. It's probably almost turned into a growth stock. Um, IBM is a big position that I just bought recently. I'm actually flattening it. I bought it at 153.90. It's kind of there right now this morning. It's trading at 154. I bought that, we know, at the beginning of the year for the blockchain play. And it's got the value component, the dividend fits in. It's 2% of my portfolio. I've got MasterCard, MA is 3% of my portfolio. It's a big position because, again, I bought that one just after the financial crisis at $16. It's 177 now. I'm up 1,000% in it. So, obviously, you know, these, some of these have just grown so much, too. Merck is a huge one, 3% of my portfolio as well. Again, fits a value description. That doesn't look too uh, good. That doesn't what's look, that? That chart doesn't look too good. Merck hasn't been good. Merck has not been a good one because I've owned it for a long time. So I've owned Merck probably just back during the financial crisis as well. I'm up in it. I bought it at $30, $40. I mean, I average in a 40 box. It's 54. I mean, really, I'm a 14 points, but I've held that a hell of a long time. So it hasn't been that great. Then I've got, I've got some ETFs. Um, 
uh, you know, for international exposure because I don't know them. I own JOF is one that I own. I've had for a long time. It's been a good one. It's J- J- Japan's smaller capitalization fund. It's got a nice yield too. You can see there's a theme. I have all these stocks with yield. Yep. Um, we know I have a little piece of General Electric, but I sold half of it. And because it's fallen so far, it's now only 0.26% of my portfolio. So it's a natural way my portfolio weeds its junk out of it. Cell Gene is a big one, 1.78%. I've got Exxon Mobil that I just bought recently. It's 1% of my portfolio. I have Momo. We know that one, which um, um, you know, I liked it back at 26. I had a big run. I'm considering selling some of the Momo just because I don't like this 40 level, but it's been a really good one for me. Um, I've had some bad ones too, like obviously GE. I'm trying to look at what the bad ones are. Most of them are green just because the market's been so strong and I've been in for so many years. So it's hard to really find any big losers here, but Alcoa Arconic has not been a good one. Um, Arconic was a spinoff. I had Alcoa for years. In the long run, Alcoa has not been good for me. Um, hey, uh, Spinner's well, some Canadian asking. Canadian stocks. I'm Canadian, like the Canadian banks, and ETFs. Yeah, what's the question? Uh, do you average down? Not very often. So sometimes, and you know, in the case, if I had a plan to average down, like in the case of Micron, I just put, you know, a small position in Micron, and Micron is like 0.3% of my portfolio right now. But because I intentionally, when I bought that, and I bought it at $60, which above the head of the report, which, you know, obviously hasn't worked out. But because, you know, I had the plan and I said that on the show, then I bought one third of my average position. I was planning on buying two thirds more here yet. So Micron is still my radar. I want to get to 50 to buy the rest of the position. I don't know if it's going to get there or not. Obviously, it's a little bit weaker here today. It didn't really rally as much with the market as you'd think. So maybe I'm going to get a shot down there at 50. But I do plan on buying more Micron if it pulls back more. Um, I've got Apple in the portfolio. I've got Google in the portfolio. Those are fairly large positions too. One, one, two percent. Uh, that's the bulk of the big stuff. And I got a lot of little stuff there too. Um, overall, I've got about 100 stocks. That's crazy. So, I don't know how you keep track of that. That's absolutely Well, crazy. I don't a good enough. Probably. Yeah, yeah, I don't. I but you know what? When you get 100 stocks and you've got the same theme going on, you're kind of just moving with a little bit of the market overall. Like if, and, and you know, a lot of preferred stocks too. So there's some Canadian preferred stocks, some US preferred stocks. So uh, I'm just trying to see if there's anything else. Newcore, NUE, it's a, it's a 1.2% of the portfolio. So, you know, all these seem relatively small. We say 1.2%. I own the Qs. You know, QQQ is 3% of my portfolio just because it has grown so much. So QQQ is a pretty good chunk of it. I bought it back at 46 bucks. It's 164. So, I mean, QQQ. The worst thing, I had a big chunk of Qs back then, Joel. This is the one downside of writing covered calls. I had a big chunk of QQQ back after the financial crisis. And I wrote some upside covered calls and we had that huge run. I got called away on like two-thirds of the position. Man, if I still had that whole position, that would have been a huge position for me. So, you know, the downside of writing covered calls is in a bull, extreme bull market, sometimes you get called away from your stocks. But now that's, you know, kind of how I've approached it. You can see is a, there's always a dividend component that I kind of like to it. So I like to get paid when my stock's doing bad. You know, I have some AT&T too. My stock's not doing well. I still like getting paid. Uh, well, no, they're asking about sector trade here, but uh, you go for you go for the individual stocks, right? You may have a couple in the same sector. Well, I focus on sectors I like, and you know, for you know, lately I've been buying a lot more drug stocks. I bought GSK a while ago, GlaxoSmithKline. It's having a good day today. I bought that around thirty six bucks, uh, just just uh, like a month ago. So, and I just wanted some international exposure. Also, I just, I still like the drug stocks here just because here, here's my idea. You know, I'm 41 years old. Now this portfolio is, you know, for me when I'm 65, 25 years from now, aging population. I like the demographics. Yes, we have some concerns with drug price caps potentially coming in. That is, you know, a short-term concern that, you know, might, might, might happen. But at the same time, we got aging population. Drugs aren't going away. We're going to need them more as population gets older. You know, I was, you know, boom, bust, necko type of guy. And that's why if I looked at my portfolio overall, I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty heavy in drugs. So it's underperformed in the last couple of years because drug stocks have not done well. But I own Celgene, Allergan, Biogen, I own all those too. So I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, that's the way I've built my portfolio. Maybe I'm doing it all wrong, but it's worked fairly well for me for the last 20 years. So I'm going to stick with it. Value stocks, you know, lower beta, my portfolio, like I said, doesn't move around as much as the other. I underperform in bull markets, but I also outperform in bear markets. Uh, oil catching a bid here. Uh, we are now up 78 cents at uh, 66.33. Not sure if we 
any news coming out on the oil market, but I just want to alert our oil traders out there that we are coming up on the high of the move and the high of the move has been almost a double top here on January 25th. You got to 66.55 and uh, just the other day, you got up to 66.55 again. That is a five-star number, current high, 66.41, folks. So uh, if you're long some oil, you're looking to get out at the high of the move. Uh, you're about 20 cents with it. Not sure if there's any news associated with that quick pop in oil. Uh, we got to talk some Facebook, Dennis. I mean, wow, that was what turned around the market yesterday. Uh, well, it's turning around the market this morning. Yeah. You think we're so? red. We're a buck fifty down here on Facebook now. Well, the so, are still up. I don't, I don't know if it was the headline or some analyst commentary came through here, but Facebook was trading up when we started the show at eight o'clock. Here we are, thirty minutes later. Facebook is now down one percent. The market is starting to leak again. I was arguing yesterday. Facebook is kind of your leader here right now. You know, we had the market sell off. Facebook obviously sold off early in the morning there with the, you know, the bad news coming in, and the market dragged the market down with it. And then Facebook rallied back, and the market rallied back too. So Facebook is kind of leading the market, and they're not going to happen like that forever, but everybody's watching that story. As Facebook starts to peel back, it spooks the market a little bit too. So was there anything that broke here in the last few minutes there, Spencer, on Facebook? Because I do see a trade down a buck and a half now. Wait, I thought I saw that Zuckerberg is not going to go and uh, testify in London, but hold on. I, I could be making that up. I, I, I saw it really quickly, so don't hold me to that. But I saw a headline on Zuckerberg from... 10, 20 minutes ago, I think. I, I, I need not to, answer I, UK I, I need to lawmakers' questions over the data scandal. I okay. do see that headline. I'm not sure if that broke earlier, if that was right at 8 o'clock when the stock started to turn down. But yes, I do see that same headline, Spencer. Okay, I didn't make that up. Good. No, you didn't make it up. So that's right. I mean, so. you got to wait for this thing to calm down a little bit here if you're looking for a swing trade, right? I mean, all this uh, all this uh, craziness and consolidation, you know, uh, volatility, not consolidation, uh, look for it to, you know, find the bottom and have found it under 150 yesterday. Uh, you took a little bit of heat cause it went to 149.02. Uh, but man, I mean, it's gotta put more than one low in here at 150. I think, uh, just underneath 150, there's a bunch of lows at uh, 148. There's absolutely a triple bottom here at 148. So keep an eye on that, but just based on yesterday's range, I mean, what can you lean on here? You know, between 150 and 160, it cut through it just like butter, took out some uh, sell stops. Uh, I'd always uh, figure the, um, you know, the daily pivot, see where that comes up. It's probably going to be in the upper three quarters region because we had the high and the close up there. And I'd use that as resistance. Uh, but I mean, it's going to take a while. You got to filter out the news and, you know, and, and see what happens with it. I think right now, uh, you know, I think it's just a volatile trade and it's hard to identify good risk reward ratios. Ed Parker talking about selling puts. We're going to have Nick on here in a minute. So we'll ask him as well. I think Nick was talking about selling puts in this as well. So we'll see what he did. You know, probably yesterday when that sell off was happening, I bet you Nick Shaheen was getting down and dirty and selling some puts too at those elevated premiums. It's sometimes a nice strategy if you're willing to buy the stock, like Nick says. Um, you know, and you're looking at, you know, grabbing some extra premium, you know, if you would buy the stock at 135, like Ed Parker is saying, maybe you look at that and you, you, you know, you sell some puts down there and if it gets down there, you own the stock, worst case scenario, best case scenario, you keep your premium. So that's something to think about. We're going to have Nick on here in the 30 yeah, seconds. He, talk about it's it a well. headline stock. And I think he was playing it a little bit. I <laughs> think though, when it comes like to these, a little headlines, more cautious. Yeah. Yeah. Because you don't know which way, uh, you know, the oh, head, I'll ask. yeah. Yep. Yep, we will. What, we'll bring you wanna, him in you and ask him. Dial up We're Nick? bringing him in right now. We're bringing him in right now. We might as well bring him right into the conversation here. Right here. Nick Shaheen, we want to ask you. So Ed Parker's in the chat here, and he's selling Facebook September and January 135 selling puts. Were you out getting down and dirty yesterday selling some puts in Facebook? Not, yesterday, I bought uh calls and i had okay. i had already sold puts and i kind of got really lucky yesterday because i had sold puts and they were doing okay i trimmed some on bounces and then i had a few left over and i wanted to protect them so i bought bought uh, shorter dated puts and then the headline broke out and it then took this dip down to like for 149 and change i was like these puts i had just bought were like massively profitable i was like forget the protection i'm booking them so i sold oh, so those puts. profit 
I sold the puts back out, left me naked puts uh, and bought calls. And so now I have a call spread that's profitable uh, in Facebook and I'm short put. So yeah, I do. I don't mind it. Um, I still don't understand the freak out unless there is malicious uh, behavior in the back end from the on on the part of Facebook. I just don't see the freak out. I mean, we're in a we're in a time where people send their DNA through the mail to get it checked at 23 and me and pay for it, and they're freaked out about a little bit of spam or targeted advertising. I mean, what kind of information is on Facebook? Um, they don't even know my real last name, so I don't know what people are giving them. So it's just a I think it's an overblown issue. So you would be, you, you, do you like the 135 selling puts? Like oh, the yeah. 35? Sure. With, with the current information, yes. I would need a new shoe to come out, a new shoe to drop, so to speak, for me to change my opinion there. I mean, mm-hmm. think about it. Um, my mother is on Facebook, and she can hardly use a calculator. And I can guarantee you she has no idea of what's going on with the headlines. So she doesn't care. She's not canceling her account. Neither are her friends. Neither are all of my family that are overseas. And I believe you, I have a bazillion cousins and they all use Facebook. None of them care about the headlines here. What about longevity? And, you know, th- this is one concern that I don't own shares of Facebook. It's a tra- It's starting to get attractive to me, though, because as a value play, it's starting to get, you know, somebody was saying that Facebook actually is trading, you know, at a multiple less than the Qs there are, you know, less than the NASDAQ and less than other tech stocks there. I don't know the forward multiples only like 18 or 19. So it starts to get attracted to me at a, at a guy like that. But then I look at it and I think, what if something cooler comes out? You know, what if something yeah. gets created that, but, you know, but, but or, or is a, Facebook but, big enough now yeah. that they don't have to worry about that? So what if something cooler comes out that better than Apple, which is a more realistic thing than Facebook? If you're on Facebook, you have thousands of pictures on Facebook until, unless they come out with something that say migrate everything, click this button to move it's everything big, onto it's a different a big deal to try to it's over, it. you know, they say a billion and a half users or whatever, but this is a planetary thing. I mean, the, the whole globe is on Facebook and especially for families, I'm speaking from a perspective where I have people all over the world. It makes it so easy to stay in contact with everybody. I personally don't use it. I use WhatsApp for that which is another company of Facebook. So, and that's even easier than Facebook because it's more private from the sense, like I'm not putting anything that people can search on, uh, but it's still data that they can use and and sell me ads. Um, I don't know about you, but for decades now, I go online and everything I've searched for ever comes up left and right of the the page. So it's unbelievable. So Google is doing it. uh, uh, Apple is doing it. You know who's the biggest offender of that is LinkedIn. Which is, I think, create uh, does actually commit crime because they do stuff I never permitted them. I didn't open a LinkedIn account, and they would tell me somebody's how, trying. Yeah, like yeah. how do they? I have a LinkedIn account. I never use it, but yeah. when I look at friends, I didn't have one. I mean, they know all my friends. They're I like, did, they're, these I friends' didn't even have one. They're right. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even have one. I was told, hey, somebody's trying to hook up with you on LinkedIn. And they gave me that the person's name. So I contacted her and I said, did you do this? She goes, no, they told me the same thing about you. And so so I know they've committed crime before when they were bought out. But, you know, I can't prove it technically, obviously, but I can prove it instance wise. And they're the biggest offender. But it's not a deal breaker for me. I'm not going to take them to jail because they're just taking information and trying to sell me stuff. So I think they need to clarify between data. They were using breach. This and the breach of data is different than breach of trust, uh, and the trust has been breached, but the data has not. These are people. The way I understand the people that are signed up, opted in, but they didn't know what they were opted in. We all click on this. We don't read anything unless you say, you know what? I don't want that platform that badly. I don't want you to poke around. So I've done that before. I say, you know what? No, not for you. For Facebook, I'd do it. For Apple, Twitter, I would do it. But for, you know, blah, 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 a company that's going to help me scan something. No, heck, I won't do that. We're on the line with Nick Shaheen. He's the author of Create Income with Option Spreads. Joins us every Tuesday to give us his technical and fundamental outlook on the markets. Uh, Nick sent out some great, uh, great video over the weekend uh, discussing the fundamentals and how think how the picture hasn't changed that much. And uh Boy, oh boy, the market listened to you. Certainly, we could talk about the trading action from yesterday. Uh, but Nick, I just, I just, one thing that we talked about yesterday is, yeah, the market had a good day, and yeah, we've rebounded. But boy, oh boy, 
the volatility. I mean, wouldn't you be more comfortable if we opened up flat and we had a little bit of a rally and a little pullback? It just seems like the volatility until the really the vol comes calms down a little bit. You still got to be concerned about the market. I am. And um, I'm concerned yesterday, not concerned, I'm puzzled yesterday. The VIX was clobbered. The VIX futures were not. They held almost green for the whole part of the morning and they finally broke down at the end of the day. And the VXX, I am convinced that these, the VXX and any trade on the VIX is completely manipulated. And I've given up on trying to make money off of it because I bought puts in the VIX at the very bottom of the stock market drop. So at the top of the VIX and I still couldn't make money. So I know somebody else is making money off me unfairly. So it, it is a point you bring up and you know, the VIX itself, uh, I don't look at it. I look at the VIX futures and I'm concerned why there's a discrepancy between relative strength and the VIX futures. So the VXX maybe can tell you that, there's something going on technically and something else going on behind the scenes that's above our pay grade. So I will continue. I, I still say be cautiously long, meaning if you have profits, book them and, and, and use house money to reset another bullish position because what you have now may not be what you have tomorrow or even five minutes uh, later because the White House is you know uh, headline palooza right now. All right, let's uh, let's move on to individual stocks in the chat. Let's start with downward dog. He's looking at Johnson and Johnson J and J. Uh, give us your technical and fundamental thoughts on J and J. Well, if I look at J and J, and I have looked a few times, and um, it seems like it, I have to go out to a, a weekly chart to actually decipher it. And it is a pivot point from a weekly perspective, so a longer term. And this dates back to uh, 2016, July. Um, they fought over this level uh, between 124 and 127. And so it is important uh, that they, the bulls defend it because uh, they broke through it and now they need to prove that indeed it is a floor from which they can rebound. If they don't, then it becomes some sort of an inverse cup and handle that could probably target the 118-ish eyeball. Not a forecast, it's just something I have to be leery of. So technically, I think, I mean, fundamentally, I think it's a sound company. It's ancient uh, from the terms of the stock market, and I don't think it's too expensive. Well, 23, 25 trailing PE, I don't know historically if that's low for it or not. Nick, I just want to ask you related to that as Procter and Gamble. Um, I played this once. I bought it 67. I sold Ooh. it up at 90 um, from my investment standpoint. It's coming back down. It's 76. I'm like, come to pop. I want to get it back under 70 here. Do you think I have a chance of this thing continuing to fall and getting this thing under 70? Or should I strike uh, earlier than that? I'm not sure you're going to get it 70. For 70, maybe I should be greedy. I should just buy it now. Well, it's on my radar. I want to buy it. I've always, I've, I played Project Gamble a few times. It's always worked out to be a winner. I always buy it when everyone hates it, and they're all hating on this thing right now. Man, okay. it's a dividend. It's, it's you know, obviously so, killed the last month and a half. So the only time it went below where it is right now is a big whoosh down in 2015, August. Was that a big market crash? That was the... That was the March wow. flash crash. So look left to that all the way back to 2013, okay. January. Yeah, it had two monthly candles, two weekly candles that took it from seventy point five up to seventy five. So the the back then is, is the answer to your question. What happened with the re weight saying, okay, we were so wrong. Let's bring it up a few uh, notches. And I don't think you're going to get it lower without a market crash. So if you want to short the markets, then wait for your seventy. Well, maybe if you're I okay should just strike now, or strike around seventy five. Came back from the <laughs> my Google wake up and it was dictating my what I was saying to you here. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what I do you got there, Nick? Up. You got something fancy? What do you got there? Yeah, what is no, that? It's, it's my Google Android phone. Talk about Google wake up. Yeah. It's what my is Android that? Phone. It's it's like the top secret. I mean, Android has had the voice to text uh, forever. You know, I wake my phone up by talking to it. I don't have to touch it. So. And, and it just, I must have said, okay, oh, I'm not going to say it again. I, I must have triggered it to wake up and start dictating what I'm asking it. But anyway, um, so yeah, I don't think you're going to get it unless if you want to short the market, then wait for a better entry point. But well, well, well here's the thing. So you want to buy it then 
and you don't know if you're, okay well sell the 70 put out in time and buy the call at the money right here right now out in time then you're along it at 70. another way right to plan. right now yeah that's an interesting strategy there um jump over here we got spinner asking about general electric i mean this oh. thing has been absolutely slaughtered i still yeah. own a little bit of my best portfolio it gets less and less of it every day just because it continues to go down i know even spencer's in the ge here now but man I tell you, this has got to be, this looks mm -hmm. like it's going on the death march. I mean, it's going to take some analyst defending this or, you know, something good company from the company to stop this like death march. It just goes down every day. I mean, yesterday, it was down yesterday. Everything yeah. was up yesterday. It was down another 1%. This thing yeah. just can't get out of the gutter. It, AbV, GE, and something else was down yesterday. Not even like Facebook. Three stocks. <laughs> and not I own two Facebook. of those. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I own AbV, too. <laughs> yeah, but AbV had a headline. Not a day for me. Kind of was, yeah. Well, I don't know anything about GE fundamentals. Uh, everybody th seems to be an expert on it, and they're all wrong. Obviously, they kept calling it, oh, it's good at 17, it's good at 13, and here it is, good at 12. I have no idea. I mean, look at this chart. There's nothing to be told. It's it's. Uh, I mean, I mean, if you own it, it's probably too late to sell it. Is it? I don't know. Where is it going? No, I mean, not have tax loss. Just take early tax losses. <laughs> early. <laughs> really Very early. early. Very early. <laughs> well, because if you sell it at the end of the year, it's going to be five bucks. <laughs> but but don't, don't, do, don't do that if you expect the markets to crash. You might have other losses that you can do. <laughs> anyway. What yeah, about, I, I, can't, uh, I can't tell you anything. What about um, AMAT? That was one of the first questions that came in from Brad D. Could you take a look at uh, AMAT for us? Uh, AMAT is technically, um, you know, it had a good spring off of 46 and yesterday it had a good candle be behind a really ugly candle before. This is weird. This is a stock that delivered last time I tracked it. I was had a, having a debate, debate whether to buy it into earnings and they said, oh, it's going to deliver good earnings, two earnings ago. And that, that's why I'm going to go along. I said, don't, because the earnings reaction doesn't represent anything about the quarter itself. And sure enough, the next day they tumbled it down and they ended up selling it down. So fundamentally, it's OK. Technically, I'm, if I'm afraid about the whole market in general, uh, I may get, get better entry points uh, for cool. AMAT. But, but I'm not saying it's going to go down. I'm just saying I, 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 I wouldn't add if I'm long. I probably wouldn't get out of it if I'm long. I would just wait and see the headlines. Holy cow, I haven't looked at this chart for a while. Spirit Era, JV Spec talking about it, says this is on the death march here too. What the hell happened to Spirit in the last four days? What's it the was ticker of that? Save. Was there, what, S-A-V-E, it's got the best ticker oh, yeah, symbol, yeah. but not the best stock right now. I had this one, I played it, um, and I sold it up at 44 bucks. I can get it cheaper here now, but you know what? Oh, wow. I guess I support a 38. You know, maybe it bounces. Yeah, no, 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 don't, don't, don't get it at 38. <laughs> Darren? Techn technically, it's not bueno over here. Um, I'll, I'll, let me show you. Show um, me, show me, show it, me. <laughs> show me. Uh, it, the 38 level is uh, wait and see because there is a fight over it. All right. If you look left, back in earnings report in, last year, July, it yep. fell it fell apart to this level on high volume and couldn't hold it it fell almost as much lower yep. it took him all the way back to november to break through it and they did and now they're trying to hold it as support and if it fails it's like a cup and handle ish uh, inverse so they rallied up to 48 and failed came back to the neckline rallied up to 46 which is lower than 48 and back to the neckline fast so this is a like somebody running and they're going to hit a wall and they're probably going to break through it. And 36 to 35 might be next if this floor doesn't hold. So today's candle is pretty important. I don't know where it is right now. It was an but, awful day yesterday. I mean, yeah. what did the air, other airlines do? LUV was up. I'm long. Days. I'm long UAL and I didn't see any reds. Yeah. So why, why save? Get, Alaska Air got hit a little bit yesterday, but save's been hit the hardest. Was there a? Like it's been it's down six bucks in four days. I mean, that's huge for a forty-four dollar stock. Yeah, this I don't is see the other airlines doing the same thing. Something's going on here. Sharp move, fast, big fast candles. Why would I want to stand in their way? If I'm long it, I'm definitely. Uh, I mean, I'm looking at price to earnings. Is that right? It's only four. Oh, it's uh, low. That's why you know. I mean, I'm the value guy, Nick. That's the kind yeah. of stocks I own are those low PE ones. <laughs> and price book is one point four. So. 
you know, long term, it's probably the metrics. Where's the floor? It probably can't be too far from here. But if the whole market falls, it's going to fall more. But I don't know what's going on. So I would do homework to see why, like you said, why is it falling? But yeah, technically, more homework. This, this this is a, a a point to worry. Downward says it's the worst airline. You know what? I completely agree with you when you fly on it. I always worry. And they get you on so many things. I just flew Spirit, took my family down to Disney World there for the weekend. Spirit's the cheapest flight. So, you know me, I'm all about value. <laughs> the flight. But you know what? They get you on so many other things. It's like, okay, uh, I, is it normal? Isn't the normal weight on your bags, you know, when you do check luggage, 50 pounds? Isn't it normally 50 pounds? I always thought it was 50 pounds. I, you're, you're talking to a guy who just hates flying these days because of my last name. You know, Joel, I'm, can you verify? It's, 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 usually, it's, yep, it's usually 50 yep. pounds, isn't it? Yep. Yep. Anyways, yep. I have both bags of 49 pounds. So I'm like, okay, I'm in. I get there. It's 40 on spirit, 40 pounds. So I'm over on both check bags. So you know so what, what, they you, charge what did you throw out? You know what they charge you? <laughs> they charge you 35 bucks on the first bag and then 60 on the second one. Uh, he, so what, he, what did you throw hundred bucks. He, he layered up. It's really you your wife behind. Well, they get you you layered up on the second one. So you didn't learn your lesson on the first one. Now you're twice as hard on the second one. Dennis, anyway, it was up? like a hundred. So I had to go both ways. They got an extra 200 bucks. There's nothing I could do. You, you could throw one pound of clothes or put them on. They can't throw out nine pounds of stuff. You're done. So I'm like, well, what are you going to do? And he got two kids. I mean, we've got a baby. You know, you can't. 50 can't pounds, I can't do it. No, no, so no. anyways, uh, so that's where we were at. So they got me, you know, and I was trying to squeeze it into two bags because I figured, you know, because they were charging me the extra 40 bucks a bag. Anyways, I'm better to put it in three bags. It would have been cheaper. But they get you in the little fine print. Don't fly anybody but the majors, man. I I, I learned that lesson. I tried it with Frontier one time. Like, you know, I was like, hey, that looks pretty cheap. And then at the time, nobody was charging for seats. So I have my seat booked. And then they tell me, oh, if you want to keep your seat, you have to pay an extra $40 or whatever. It's like, say what? I booked my seat already. It's like, oh, yeah, but this is we don't give you the seat. And, and it's, it was terrible. Man, they don't, don't even that. give you a glass of water. Nothing on spirit. I don't want any of the crap. I'm parched. I don't even I get nothing. You get nothing extra. You want water? A bottle? Yeah, it's five bucks. We'll get you. We'll get you. <laughs> Anyways, they get you on all the fine stuff. So if I fly by myself, next time I fly by myself, I'll fly spirit because I can go. Drive. He hasn't learned. Oh, my God. So when you got the three-year-old, the three-year-old's got demands, man. And, you know, you got a three-year-old on an airplane. They got demands. So, you know, they see the little food cart go by. They're like, hey, hook me up with some of that stuff. But and meanwhile, you know, obviously, you know, everything on that food cart's five bucks for a Nutri-Grain bar. So they get you. They get you. All right. Let's talk. <laughs> enough of your, you guys. Uh, yeah. We're trying to figure out why save is going down. Save needs to get above part. 39. I'm yeah. saying if it gets above 39 bucks, it has a chance. Uh, a bull would say you had a rally from 30 to 48, 18 point move and have any retracement. So I'd say if it could get in whole 39, stabilize. It might be okay, but uh, below 38, you can tell the 35, 36 level. Uh, who's been patient? Downward Dog has been patient. CMI, that's that's Cummins, isn't Cummins, it? Yeah. Cummins, yeah. Cummins. What's, uh, yeah. what's going on right. with CMI? Trying to find support here, flat in the pre-market. Yeah. That's uh, my son would like to put a CMI engine in his truck. So, uh, okay. So I, this is a, they're testing a floor at 146. So if that br breaks, uh, they, they have a uh, technical risk down to, I don't know, 147, 70, um, 148 maybe. So not an obvious entry point. Uh, it, it's probably going to need the market's help. I don't know if it has, earnings soon or not i don't know the metrics i can't remember uh, valuation relative because they they go hand in hand somewhat with cat to a certain degree uh, so the trump trade should work for their favor and they're not expensive i looked it's like 15 pe on a trailing basis so um, i don't mind being long it um, i could sell some put spreads in it but much slower to leave room for error and it has corrected uh, a lot but i don't like when i see lower highs banging on a floor if the floor breaks, they overshoot lower. Uh, so you want it to hold that floor and use it as a springboard to rebuild higher. Last one. It's a low price one and it's an easy one for you. GoPro here. Whoo. Yeah, last thing on the CMI, the lower highs create a trend line break upside potential too. Okay. GoPro. Not much to say business? about GoPro here. Yeah. Uh, they changed the name to go low. Yeah. <laughs> go no. I mean, it's, it's just. No go. No go. Potential no double go. bottom, I guess. You can lean yeah. on at 456. I mean, I 
I don't, I don't know. It's, it's now an option. Yeah, it is an option. You, you just play it itself. Uh, um, I remember at 90, they, they called it the YouTube killer. I said, short that thing. That was the high. And so I don't know what to tell you here. I mean, I know nothing about their fundamentals. I know that the management keeps making mistake after mistake. Cool products, uh, cool videos. Uh, I, I don't know why it's down here. Valuation. I mean, uh, they're losing money, obviously, but it, it, there's nothing to decipher. Better, better places this, to put your money. All right. We're yeah, gonna, we're absolutely. gonna let uh, let you go, Nick Shaheen. He's the author of Create Income with Option Spreads. Joins the show every Tuesday. Uh, give us his fundamental and technical outlook on the markets. Great information, Nick. I think we got another wild day ahead of us. Uh, Spoos are leaking here. Uh, now eleven. Come on, on. come on. <laughs> Nick's always yeah. good. Whenever I get like super bearish, he like he like sends me a video and then he calms me down and stuff. So. He really good balancer, Nick. So we. Will. I, I did. I, I want to say that if we stop the headlines, we will have new highs. That's my guess. Nick, we're not. We're not going to stop the headlines for we another will. four we will. years until and if Trump's uh, reelected, it's going to be another seven years. So I, you can't I trade off. If we that. stop this, you think he gets set, back in. Stop, he could stop, get back in. Oh, yeah. He, of course, he's going to get back in. Oh, you 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 think he's going to get back in? You're if in. If they have another election right now, he would win again. I I can guarantee you that. There's some people that really like him. A lot of people like him, but they're afraid to say it. Yeah, closet Trump lovers. That was why he won. Everybody, I, I made that argument because Hillary's winning all the polls, but the people that were taking the polls didn't want to say they were vote for Trump. <laughs> <laughs> all right, anyway. Nick, we're going to let you go, and we'll speak to you again next week. All right, later, bye. All right, uh, Spoo's uh, Yayo is looking to, to, to bottom of the range now. I I looked at the daily chart, twenty six hundred to twenty eight hundred. This is just a no man's land here, but uh, we'll see. I mean, if we go right on the session here, then we got some room on the downside. But that's man, that's yeah, room everywhere. There's, I'm yeah, predicting and, yeah. <laughs> there there, there is just room everywhere. You be careful in this market. This isn't going to be like a half percent up half percent down day this is going to be either you know a, a two or three percent down day or a two or three percent up day we're not staying where we are right now it's going to be a wild one so just because it doesn't look wild this morning doesn't mean it's not going to be wild we're in price discovery mode in this market here right now so still going to be wild don't get caught on the wrong side of the trade okay well, let's go to ratings do we got any ratings let's go to imbalances imbalances sure. Because, well, yeah, yeah, we haven't given imbalances any love. 27 minutes ago, these came out. And there is some big ones here this morning. Square, SQ, not good news for you here, Joel. And obviously, I'm back in the money here or getting close to being back in the money. 189,000 shares to buy this morning in Square. It is trading up 1.2%. Alibaba, huge day for Alibaba there yesterday as well. Big rally back, nice candle. Touched almost 180 on Friday. It is now back over 192 two days later. It has 66,000 to buy here this morning. General Electric even getting love here this morning. You know what? I'm fading that as a trader. Uh, 123,000 to buy. It's trading up nine cents. It seems like every single rally in GE gets sold. Why is today going to be any different? Four hundred thirty-three thousand to buy. Four. Do you think about the eleven dollar level though? There. So, um, also in Ford in my investment portfolio. There. Wish I didn't. It hasn't been a good one. It's been a value trap. Um, I just want to look at the book in Ford just to see if there was anything at eleven. Yeah, a hundred thousand, seventy thousand, ten ninety-nine. So it's not as big as you think, but it thickens up there eleven. So as you get closer to that, it runs into trouble. Bank America, huge buy and bounce, 371000 to buy. The banks were strong yesterday. They had nice relief rallies after getting annihilated on Friday. So Bank America, JP Morgan, 61000 to buy. The banks look strong here this morning, assuming the TLT. Well, TLT is green, so that's always interesting. You know, you got the banks strong, but TLT is green. So just keep an eye there. Um, if they start to roll over, it could be an opportunity. Salesforce.com, CRM, 45000 to buy. Nike, 37000 to sell. That's going the opposite direction there. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway, BRK.B, 49000 to buy. That's about it. Hey, let's talk, before we uh, end the show, let's talk Tesla here. And, uh, you know, we've been talking about the, the trading range, right? Yeah. And there's been some news. There's definitely been some news out that hasn't been positive. Uh, uh, the uh, Uber car uh, killed someone in, in Arizona. They're uh, suspending uh testing of driverless cars there that that you know that shook the market you got that chance under 300 again yesterday i uh, made a low yesterday at uh, 291.38 and then came roaring back 
Uh, you did have a low just above that at 295.13. So still uh, lots of support in there. Still People t- will say it took out the 300, but really when you look at it, Joel, not there was multiple long. times it took out the 300. So I'm not saying that the support is 300. I think I go all the way back, and you know Nick always says go, go a ways back. You still listen to the show. And you go back to April, you see 290.76. Then you see back in, and I'm going back to April 2017, obviously a year ago. And then November, you look at, we got to 292, and then we touched and kissed a few times 300 on the kisser. Then just earlier this year, we got down to 294, and then yesterday, we get down to 291. So as long as above 290, that's the line in the sand for me. What are you saying? Uh, I agree. I mean, if you're doing this for a swing trade, lean on the you know that low of the move there. There is a little gap under that. You just want to keep sustained closes over 300. You don't want to start to lose it and then get heavy and then have a couple closes on there and then pressure. Because if you do uh, take that out, I mean, you got a lot of room down to 250, 260. Um, I did talk to uh, or email uh, with Gene about, you know, the, the cards and stuff. And he said, you know, it's unfortunate things that happen, but he, he still believes uh, that, you know, autonomous driving is way going to be way safer uh, than humans driving. And that, you know, this is, you know, something that happened, but, you know, overall he thinks that, you know, he's still, he's not, he's not budging from his thesis. So I uh, just yeah. want to tell you on that. Did I tell you my Tesla story there from uh, a couple of weeks ago? I went to Somerset and no. went to the Tesla store in Somerset mall. No. Did you buy one? Yeah, I, I wanted it. So my buddy was saying, I didn't even know Somerset had a Tesla store. And one of my friends said, Oh, you can go, you know, in, into the Somerset mall and you can sit in the Tesla. So I was like, cool. So went to Somerset Mall two weeks ago with my wife and my two kids and uh, go to the Tesla store. It's busy. Like there's a lot of people and they've got the SUV and they got the, they don't have the, the, not the cheap one. They had the SUV, which was starts at $80,000. Nice car. And then they had the, the main one. What is the Model S or what, I forget the, the so letters, the model, but model the sports three. car. The Model 3, right? The Model 3. That's the they had that one, too. So, anyways, this is a lineup to actually get in there and sit in the car. They've got them going in the front and the back. So, you can, you know, get in the little line to sit in the back and get in the little line on the other side to sit in the front. So, it's a fairly busy store, um, you know, when you're lining up just to sit in the cars. But, anyway, so, we sit in the SUV. Really cool. You know, and it was just me and the boy. My wife actually went to the, uh, she, she went to another store with the baby. So, it was just me and the boy, you know, checking out the Teslas. And uh, so, we go in the SUV and it's cool. And then we're sitting in line and we get in the Model 3. And we get in the back seat of the Model 3, and I'm like, wow, this is a nice car. I'm looking all around. And then I, I, I smell something. I'm like, what? I look over at Spencer. I go, did you toot? <laughs> and my three-year-old tooted in the Tesla. There's people in the front seat that I don't even know. And I'm like, we got to get out of here. Because <laughs> my boy, is, he's get the stinky toots going. So anyways, he, so I go, did you toot? And he goes, Yes, he looks both ways. Yes, so I was like, ah, we gotta go. <laughs> so we got out of the Tesla and then we left the store embarrassed. <laughs> so my three-year-old boy tuned in the back of the Model Three. <laughs> okay, if I don't think it's time to end the show now, <laughs> we left. We left on. I've never told a tooting story on the show. You gotta before, get so. Spencer on again. You gotta get the real. You know, we got our Spencer, but your Spencer is so cute. We gotta get him on sometime. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all, right. all right, Dennis. All right, all right. Dennis. It's a lot. Dennis, we we'll talk to you tomorrow. Uh, Joel and I are going to hang out for a few minutes. Okay. Uh, and we're going to answer your questions on some tickers that you have. Throw them out in the chat, uh, the pre market chat or the YouTube chat. And uh, Joel will do a breakdown. So yeah. Joel, why, don't you, so. why don't you grab the screen and uh, we okay. can we can start with uh, where should we start? I, I'm going to the chat. Do you have anything you want to start with? I'm Let sharing see. my screen let's, here. Let's start with um, – I'm going through the chat now. Uh, we, did, we did all these with Nick. Did we do all those with Nick? Did all these with Nick. I'm going to the earlier in the show. Did we do um, – we kind of got to a lot of them today. If you don't have questions, that's cool. Uh, we can – we'll just hop – you know what? Let's start with LFIM, Longfin. Because oh, they're, yep, yep, they're, yep. they're they're getting crushed this morning. They are getting delisted. They're getting um, delisted. For, no, no, they're they're getting. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, take, 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 take that back. They're getting removed from Russell indexes on March 28th. They Ooh. they they didn't meet the uh, minimum five percent free float requirement as of February 14th. So okay. uh, they're getting taken off the Russell indexes. 
that's not good news. They are pounding this thing. We talked about this a little bit. Who was it? Was it our uh, our Monday guest or our Friday guest? I we asked Ian Weiner about it, and uh, he was very skeptical of it. Obviously, you don't know what's you know something like this is going to happen. But they are pounding it. It's down fourteen dollars and twenty six cents. They're throwing it out of their portfolio. Not far off the pre market low. Pre market low is 40. What do we got here? 44 even, right on the nose, trading up at uh, 45. So keep an eye on that. That's a big drop. Let's see if the dailies can give you any kind of hope at that area. Not a lot of activity. Let's see what we got at 44. Nope, under 44, I do see an area of interest if the decline continued. I see a trio of lows at 42.50, and that was back from the middle of the March. So under 44, we're keeping an eye at 42.50. Uh, Gerald Yates in the YouTube chat is asking about MasterCard MA. Well, I've told Dennis to sell this at 50, 100, 150. I haven't told him to sell 200 yet because it hasn't got up there. Uh, super extra major resistance here. You got a big seller over 180. And the reason I say that is because you've had multiple highs 8352, 8373, 8217, 8317, 83 and a quarter. So you got a big seller lurking out there and in the one, you know, 183 handle. Uh, but you're going to have to step down now because your two-day high is 180.26. So if you're looking for a little bit of a rally, get back up to Thursday's zone, uh, 180.26. And you're actually clearing a double top from Friday and Monday. So under 177.50, uh, I'd be a little bit concerned that maybe giving some of the gains back. Of course, the close at 77.17. Uh, George is asking about gold and boy, I just have not had a feel for the gold market as of late 1350. I mean, you did have a, a rally above that your two day high 1361.90. That's a target on the upside, but it's trading the red again. It just seems like you're not going to get a really another leg higher. I know you can bust above 1360 close above there and make a shot at 1400. Uh, coming back on the downside, I mean, your two-day low is down at 1349.30. Excuse me, we're below that. Your three-day low is not till 1335. So it still looks range-bound for now, and uh, it's a pretty big and volatile range. Uh, going back to uh, Ed Parker here, Celgene. And Spencer, let me know if we have any news on any of these so I don't trip myself up here. Uh Nice. I mean, you've said this a couple of times, said this a couple of times, you know, find the double bottom, finding some support. Uh, 85 is the level you close almost three bucks or two bucks off that. Uh, you got to be concerned. Another leg lower if it takes out 85 is that represents a double bottom coming back on the upside. We closed near yesterday's high, but can't get real excited about that. You Trading at 87.80, uh, 87.69 is your two-day high. Might get a little run if it continues. 89.03 is your three-day high. So that's lining up uh, pretty pretty well here. Yes, the S&Ps are continuing to leak, as Yayo says. Uh, loss of 50% retracement. We may get a chance to buy it flat on the session. Uh, we'll see what happens with that. Um, X for stock jock. Um, XLK, is that, that's a technology ETF, I think. Uh, nice move yesterday. I keep an eye on that area of support from Friday, uh, 65.99. You also had uh, two other lows right there, or one other low at 65.87. So 66, the major support. Uh, your resistance, uh, your your four day high is 68.69. I'm not with the S&P's leaking. I am not sure we're going to get to see that level today. Uh, EXP. Exploration, what will come express? Is that a help me out here? EXP Eagle Materials, uh, traded down 57 cents in the pre market. Man, your pesky, pesky resistance here. Yesterday's high 106.16, another high at 105.84. So 106 is your big level above that. You close above 106. Uh, Couple other highs to deal with, but it looks like you got room up to 110. 
uh, coming back down. Got a ways to go at uh, yesterday's low at 101.33, but I'd like to see this break above, take out the sellers at 106 and continue uh, to move north. Uh, let's see here. Rocket 1530. He is looking at Clorox CLX. These stocks have just been under pressure. Looks like we're making a not, not much volume trading. This one did not participate in the rally yesterday. Uh, I'm not sure if that's an odd lot printing there or what, but uh, 123.64 was yesterday's low, only a 24.22 close. So, really. Did not participate with the market. Two closes right there, 124.40 and 124.22. The other thing I could say is if you have a stock that go, you know, the market goes up 700 points and your stock is down 18 cents on the session, it's telling you, you know, it doesn't want to go up because that's a lot of momentum. George wants a quick look at Red Hat. Red Hat was red hot. Trading up 1042 at 163.51. The at the top of the show, that thing was just continuing to move higher. And uh, keep an eye on the open if you really want to try and sell the all time high, uh, 164 and a quarter. Uh, we just hit that, we backed off 70 cents like that. So, not quite as strong as chart as uh, when we started the show, but uh, keeping an eye on 164 and a quarter in Red Hat. Um, I can't feel my Facebook is X asking about Visa. And let's see here. Trading up 36 cents in the pre-market at 121. Even let's go to the daily chart. See what we have. Trading above yesterday's high as we speak. Yesterday's high, 120, uh, 74, 120, 64 close. Just don't want to see it go red. I mean, if it goes red, you can see you don't have support for quite a while. Probably find some uh, intermediate levels in between there. Uh, if things get real going, real good to the upside, your three-day high is 122.68. But it kind of feels like now, is even if you just take the activity that's going on in the S&Ps, you know, so people that took some stuff home last night or are picking stuff up in the after hours or pre-market, uh, are looking at the market pulling back here, and uh, I think you will so find some sellers ahead of like Thursday's high because that's kind of when everything started. Uh, also, looking at the chat, uh, XIV, he's still salty about the XIV. Uh, let's take a look at that. XIV, that is wow, well, how come it's not coming up for me? XIV. As in, like, the ETF? Yeah, isn't it XIV? Yeah. Huh. That's, that's weird. Yeah, my trade station is not pulling up that one. So, Spencer, you want to do some chart analysis on XIV? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> I, I will pass on uh, on that. But there was nothing else. Got oh, delisted. it got delisted. That's why. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, that's the – come on. That was the – the the inverse volatility one that oh that, that, he slipped that in on come us on. huh that, who that, did that X X I V was the one that yeah yo crapped the bed in February and the uh, and the whole thing the whole bottom that's fell right out. that's yeah. right that's v right. very nice well we'll end on that he got me we'll end on that note so. I am I am I'm I'm salty yeah yo got me on that yeah. I can't I was thinking that, like that sounded familiar but yeah. uh, no no no. All right, S and P still up seven and, and three quarters points, sixty seven and a quarter, folks. I can't give you any support down to the close. The close is fifty nine fifty. Your pre market low stands at fifty six seventy five. So no real downside till we take out that fifty six point seven five. All right, on tomorrow's show we've got Harlan Pine, AmazingPowerPatterns.com is his site. He's an old favorite of ours, so he'll be joining us tomorrow at eight thirty five. If you want to catch any part of today's show, you can do so on our podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Stitcher, or go to YouTube.com slash Benzinga TV and rewatch it. The show there. Hope you all have had a good morning so far, and you have a good rest of your day. We'll see you, folks, tomorrow. <laughs>